This right here is uh, it's our net OSPF process. So the multicast address, if you've never heard, or this is the first time, or you're not comfortable with that specific uh, uh, topic or idea, think of it as your local Irish pub. Think of it that happens to be a pub where only soccer games are played on the TV. So only soccer fans show up there. In this case, soccer fans will be OSPF. So a router that does OSPF, a router or a fan that only looks at soccer games will show up there. This guy will show up there. As soon as everybody shows up at the same pub, at the same club to look at the game, you're going to start saying, hey, by the way, my name is Julio Casablanca, and here's my address. Now, keep in mind, every time as I talk about address, and every time I share interfaces that are attached to me, there's a chance that another router that speaks the same language has an interface that belongs to the same network you have an interface. In this particular case, if you take a look at this network, this router right here has an interface in that network, and so this, this router has an interface here. So if this guy shows up in this uh, multicast, in this club, this guy shows up there and say, I'm router A. And by the way, I do have an interface on network Z. This guy right here is going to show up and say, I'm router B. Oh, by the way, I have an interface on router Z. Pronounce it like, like the bridge pronounce it, Z. Right? And uh, as soon as they do that, the two of them are going to realize, there's a good chance we're neighbor. Would you like to be my neighbor? Uh, and they will actually go through a rather interesting handshake where they exchange certain parameters. And in OSPF, those parameters have to be exactly the same for both of them before they become full neighbors. Once they become full neighbor, once that's approved, these both routers will do the same. They will build a database of neighbors. And these are full neighbors. Once you become a full neighbor, neighbor, you will share with that guy your topology table. He will share with you his topology table. So you will then trigger updates and you build your topology table. Once your topology table has a new entry, you're going to trigger a process. This is a mathematical process. It is the shorter path first process. And what that does is it calculates the network from your point of view. So if we're talking about B right here, looks like he's in the middle at the bottom of the tree, upside down tree, and he will calculate without creating a loop every single path to every single route within the network. Okay? Now, the other cool thing besides being able to build dynamically discover each other using the concept of a multicast, exchanging information using the concept of a neighbor. The other cool, cool thing is it will calculate that path using bandwidth. So you actually may have from router A to router B two routes, whichever is the fastest route, that's the one it's going to pick. That's one of the advantages you have. This here, this diagram shares with you the actual hierarchical model. All OSPF network must have, at a minimum, one, one area, which is area zero. Area zero, if you have a multi-area environment, is what's considered a transit area, meaning this is a full network here with 50 routers. This is a full network here with 50 routers. This guy here is what we call a border area area, border area router, meaning half the router is in one area, half the router is in the other area. The same thing with that guy, same thing with this guy. There should be no endpoints right here, no traffic right here. All the traffic that goes, that happens to flow through here is because it's going from one area to another area, from one area to another area. The intention is to build, build a hierarchy. This, besides being in both area, being a border, it actually helps you isolate a problem. So if it turns out there's a problem here, these guys are calculating, this guy will cap it. Nobody here needs to know because to them, to get to a router that belongs in area one, all they have to point it is to this interface right here. They don't need to worry about anything but happening right there. So you could actually, you can see how a, a multinational network or even a multi-state network, you can set this up as East Coast, West Coast, South, 
And if you have problem on the East Coast, you'll cap it right there and it won't propagate to the rest of the network. You could also use this as a point where you create super routes or aggregate your IP address. And that way you minimize the number of routing tables. But this design has been proven and you can design massive, massive uh, networks, highly scalable at that point. And going back to the same diagram that we share on our rib, if in this particular case, you wanted to send um, a packet that happens to be one gig capacity from LAN one to LAN two, remember in rib, it will always pick this route, meaning that route, because it's only one hop away. So pick that guy right there. In OSPF, this is your LAN 1 right here, and this is your LAN 2 right there. OSPF completely ignore this guy, and it will grab that one, that one, and this will be my third option. It will make a decision based on the fastest uh, route. Dynamic routes. We have here multiple. We actually have three simulations here. Uh, because we need to talk about multiple concepts. But this is your RIP routing protocol. This is your OSPF routing protocol. And we're going to verify that for you in a second. Uh, we're going to show you uh, some, some basic steps. You don't, need to, uh, you don't need to know how to configure this to appreciate how it works. But we'll do it in a minute. We'll do uh, an actual trace route so you can see the destination. But if I, I'm going to open this on the command line interface. I'm going to go ahead. And do show running config. Oh, sorry. Let me go to the enable mode. Show running config. And all I want to show you is that, in fact, in this router, the only routing process that is activated happens to be RIP. And he is, in fact, attached to three networks uh, that he's going to share across the board. Uh, so, what I'm going to do is, in this one, is I'm going to do a trace route. And I'm going to try to hit from here a network that happens to be behind that and the network IP address is 3333 3, 3. okay now notice that it chose the route 10412 this is 10410 that's the this is that network and that interface 10412 so it went this direction that is rip and as we mentioned before it makes a decision based on hop count now, right here, and I'm going to bring them both from for you to, to see this. There you go. This happens to be the, this one right here is the OSPF one. So we're going to enable this. We're going to do trace route, same one, two, four. And notice when I try to ping that same route, it chose three, ten, three, uh, so 10.3 is this direction, and then it went 10.5, uh, 10.2. Actually, it either it, it, it chose this side or that side. Either one of the side, it will pick either one of those uh, route. They both have the same value. This we took one uh, millisecond, and, and that basically, because it's the first one, the second one, it found it found it really fast. Uh, but uh, OSPF will make decisions based on on its own, uh, uh, based on the speed of the bandwidth, not a hop count. Now, one of the concepts that a lot of people uh, have a hard time understanding is, uh, and I'm going to show you this, show running config here. Uh, notice that the only routing protocol I have set up here is OSPF. And if I do show, show running config here, know that the only routing protocol I have to on here is RIP. A router could, in fact, have multiple routing protocols turned on at the same time. And I'm going to show you a third version of this which happens to be this network right here. And uh, I'm going to show you this. Let me enable this. Show running config. And if you go, if we take a look at the configuration, notice that I have RIP activated in OSPF. So let's talk about that for a second. On a router, on a router, or any appliance, regardless of the vendor, on a router, and this is the router. This will be the interface where traffic comes into the router. And these here are interfaces where traffic are going out of the router, provided the mailman or the routing process make a decision to send it over there. Very good. 
Now notice right here is the module, the software module or hardware module with software that we call routing processes. You may turn on one or multiple ones. So this here is static, this here is RIP, this here is OSPF. They could all be working for you. This you'll do manual. This will calculate, this will calculate. But you could actually configure those. They will all be working for you. They will all calculate, they will all process, and then they will all report to something we call the IP routing table. Keep in mind that this has its own perception of the network from its point of view. This has its own perception plus his own calculation algorithm and he makes decision one way based on hub count. And this guy has his own perception of the network. So the problem that the mailman has is when I read this table, how do I know what's the best path? How do I make a decision? What really happens in reality, even though every single one of these guys happen to be active at the same time, Whoever has the lowest administrative distance gets installed here. The other ones are there for backup. If you want to keep them, they will burn processing power. They will burn uh, CPU power. But by the time the packet hits the mailman and the mailman needs to explore this, only one of the three gets entered there. And it is based on the lowest AD, administrative distance. That is the distance that gets assigned by the vendor, and actually, there is a de facto uh, agreement in the IETF, the Internet, the Internet Engineering Task Force. So, static routes are the lowest, OSPF are the second lowest, and RIP are the highest number. Now, one vendor may choose to make this number one or number 10, this guy number 90 or number 50 or number 20, and this guy here number 120. The actual number is irrelevant. So long as you remember, statics are the lowest, RIP are the uh, highest, OSPF are the second lowest. Uh, now, they, they report to this guy right here, and you see that. Now, when the time this guy read it, he'll pick the decision. If you were to have them all three turn on at the same time, this the mailman will always choose a static route. If you were to get rid of this, and these two are active at the same time, then Every, everything from OSPF will get populated first unless there's a route that RIP is the only way to get there. Okay, I'm going to show you that on the actual demo with, that we were looking at before so you can actually see it. Very good. And this is RIP and OSPF as you can see there. If we actually happen to come and let's open up one of these net, uh, routers. I'm going to enable this show IP route, which is a command to see the actual table. This is a table. Oops. Let me bring it back. As you can see, this is a table. Now, depending upon the, all the vendors, some of them will have a graphical interface, some of them have CLI, but all the vendors have this table. All of them will have on top some sort of legend. So you can see right here that if it's O, that is a route that I learned via OSPF. Is this, if it happens to be R, is a route that I learned via RIP. And now take a look at this. Right here in this bracket are this specific vendor numbering scheme. So if I learn it via OSPF, it's 110. If I learn it via RIP, it's 120. OSPF being the lowest. So what that tells me is whenever, whenever, Traffic shows up, and let's just let's just for the sake of matching the example, let's make sure that RIP, and let's just say RIP is not a player in this case. Okay, for the sake of this example, let me activate, get that rid of that. So when the traffic comes right here, the mailman or the actual routing in, uh, process takes a look at it. He will pick up the OSPF route within the table and send it out the egress the OSPF tells me to, to take it out. Well, my friend, we've come to the end of this tutorial. Thank you very much for your time.